Jay Peterman is what many people know him uh, as from uh, Seinfeld, of course. He was great on that. All right, let's bring John in. Let's talk to him. I, I'm so I want to find out about uh, John. Uh, oh, hi. Wow. Hey, debonair You're looking. so handsome. This guy. Oh my gosh. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's looking at the Miss Morning Glory calendar. And... Wow. Good morning. How are you, my very man? Very nice. Nice close-up. On... Well, I got the close-up now. It was on you. You look. Uh, you look very debonair. You're very God. I. Uh, you dress for the sofa. Listen, I'm a very. <laughs> I'm a very straight man. But if I. If I. <laughs> Should could, I separate if I could you pick two? A, if I could pick a look, that would be it. Oh, I thought you were gonna jump on him and make. No, I'm just. I'm just saying that's a good look. Mm-hmm. No, then, listen, at any time you get a compliment like that before noon. You can get you can get one shock jock to cross the line before noon. You've done your job. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's a good. I'm a straight guy. That's a good. It's a good look, man. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, so you're doing Chicago. Chicago. We open tomorrow night uh, at uh, Playhouse Square. It's going to be kind of fun. I'm looking forward to it. How long have you been doing this particular? I show? have done uh, over a thousand performances as Billy Flynn. Really? Uh, wow. Since 2005. Do you ever screw on Broadway up and, uh, after a thousand? You've done, I mean, you've done it a thousand times. Do you ever screw up? I would say I probably can count on one hand the couple of times, the few times that I, that I, but I'll tell you, this is a show that is written with such a, it has such a beat to it. It's a jazz kind of tempo. So if you screw up, it's a little bit like <laughs> screwing up Shakespeare. You can't really like fudge the right. iambic pentameter that Shakespeare has written in. Right. You know? It's like you can't slip the word Oldsmobile in there and, uh, and, and, and come out right. No, it's, it's very, so when you miss a line in Chicago, it throws you off. As opposed to other shows where you that are more conversational, uh, it's uh, when you're doing a live stage. Obviously, it's different from TV. But when you're doing a live stage show uh, and and you screw up as an actor, do you, are you able to just sort of uh, you know let that go, or does that bother you? For it bothers. A while? Oh, it bothers does. me terribly. Yeah, I mean, you let it go. Obviously, you forgive yourself because no one in the audience knows that you've screwed up. But um, but it, it it bothers you when you don't have it. It throws you off your stride. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and. and uh, and if you, there have been other shows where I've had larger mistakes, like when the phone is supposed to ring in the play and it doesn't ring. Yeah, you know, life <laughs> genuinely just stops, and there's nothing you can. You know, if, if the entire plot is contingent on the phone ringing, it's you're going to sit around and wait. I don't care what you do. You know, <laughs> well, I'd love it if that phone rang right now. <laughs> then the show and my life could continue. <laughs> Are are the is it a different personality of people who act like on Broadway and in plays as opposed to actors, television and movies and that sort of stuff? That's an interesting question. Um, yes, yes, I I would say that we have more of we have more of a Broadway family um, through the theater than we do of of the television shows I've done or the movies there's a sense of, of of being more temporary television shows and you're there if you're doing a movie you're there for you know a month or you know 6 weeks or you're only there for a few days or, mm-hmm. but if you're doing a broadway show you're there for a while and yet, yet there's a sense of it, it being a family i think more so so and i think it uh, i think it, you gen, generally a different type of person is is in the theater than is in television or film even though even though they cross quite a bit i mean it, you know people there are there are actors that do both, you know. But, uh, but I would what say would you general. prefer if you if you if you had to stick with uh, one form? Oh, I love theater. I just love that. The would theater. be your favorite. Yeah. You would. You would think. There is something that is, and, and and especially Chicago. I love the show because I know at eight o'clock, I know something that the audience doesn't. That they're going to be standing on their feet. They're going to be applauding by ten thirty, and they're going to have had the time of their lives. I can't say that about television. I can't say that about film because they're editors' mediums. Basically, when you're doing television, you're trying to put enough stuff in the can to let an editor. And the same thing with film. You're trying to put enough stuff together that an editor will figure out some mm-hmm. at some other point. And scenes that you do are out or just, you know, they've you know, they cut you out totally or they've cut to this, to that. Or, they you know, you're, you're all of a sudden in a over-the-shoulder shot when you were speaking. And it's like it, it, so you don't really know what you're doing. And how it's going to affect people and the, the product. You ever get done with but something on, and see it and go, oh my God, oh, that's it's the reason, awful. <clears throat> this, this, is, this is ridiculous. That was the reason I never watched Seinfeld. First, <laughs> I, seriously, I never, wa- I never, I don't watch what I do. So 
theater is a wonderful medium for me because I can't watch what I do. Do you just get, yeah, I don't listen. I'm, like when we do best of shows, we've mm-hmm. been on vacation for almost a month now. This is our first day back. And I don't listen to the show because it, it, I always, I sit there and I critique myself. I said, I, I should have said this. It would have been funny if I would have done. Why didn't I ask John O'Hurley that? It, it's so mm-hmm. obvious. It's so obvious when you're mm-hmm. sitting there listening. But when you're doing it, it it's not so obvious. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's the beauty of it is I enjoy living just performing in the moment what is there is all you have and what what you what you brought to it at that moment has got to be enough because i you just tear your hair out otherwise and i'm not entertainment to myself so when you, i watch myself on television i'm not entertaining you 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 never really watched any of the seinfeld episodes no i didn't not for a first run i didn't no because i'm very frustrated by editing you know, it's like I, I, the, uh, Peterman would have these wonderful two-minute monologues that would go on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> and because the show was always 10 minutes too long, the first thing they would cut would be the Peterman <laughs> monologue. So I would have all, and, and the writers <laughs> spent all the time writing that. And, you know, the writer was upset. You know, it, so I, the, the best thing to do was enjoy it as a piece of theater the way you did it. Well, have you ever done any, watch it. any projects of your own where you, uh, like, uh, besides acting, where you want to direct and you're the guy who's in charge of a particular uh, well, project? I do. I mean, I do a lot of one-man shows. I do a lot of corporate speaking and things of that nature. And I, uh, you know, I do a lot of performing outside. But if you don't like what the editor does on a, let's say, a movie or a mm-hmm. show or whatever, you're the guy. You see, you could make your own, you know, do mm-hmm. your own project, and you're editing. Uh, you're you're calling the shots there. I do. I do quite a bit of that actually. A lot of videos, uh, comedic videos that I do on the internet that are out there. You always wanted to be an actor. I understand from the time that you were <clears throat> two, three years old. Three years old. I knew exactly what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And when people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up with a sense of disgust, I would put my hands on my hips and say, well, I am an actor, as I would point to the black and white television (laughs) in the corner of the room, so that's what I'm going to be. And the fact that nobody would understand that was just bewildering to me at the age of three. So I knew what I wanted to do, and, 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 and and I always identified myself as an actor. At the age of 10, this is a true story, at the age of 10, I would steal the black and white portable television set. I would take it up put it under the covers with the little rabbit ears there, and at 11.30 at night, turn it to UHF, and on NBC I would watch the Johnny Carson show because that was my connection to real actors and stars. And, And I remember at 10 years old, during a commercial break, getting out of bed, walking around the room, again with my hands on my hips, worried about what I was going to finally tell Johnny Carson when I got there because I didn't have any stories. I had no stories to tell. And so the first time that I was on The Tonight Show, Johnny was not there. Jay Leno had taken over. And I remember, I remember sitting there, and I had my hands on each of the arms there on the chair next to the desk. And during the commercial break, he leaned over to me, and he says, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm just saying hi to a 10-year-old kid. <laughs> True story. You know, it, it, it sort of, it, I always knew from the time I was maybe about eight that I wanted to be on the radio. Mm-hmm. And people who... who, who uh, know what they want to do in life. I don't know what it was, but this is this is what I've always wanted to do. It sort of gives you a sense of peace because you're not... I run into people all the time. They have no idea what they want to do with themselves or mm-hmm. what they want to be or what they want to do in life. They have no clue. Mm-hmm. You, you always knew. I always knew. I just didn't know how to do it. I just didn't know how I was going to... Uh, it, it was bewildering to me how I was going to make the reality that I saw in my imagination... The reality that was actually there. Where did you grow up? Uh, where were where were when where you were this ten year old kid? Where were you? I was in New England. Okay. I was mostly most of my life in Connecticut. So far <laughs> away from Los Angeles or far New away York, from, and or, it's another world. Even though I was only uh, you know two and a half hours away from New York City, it was another world. I had no idea. I didn't know any actors, um, but that's what I wanted to be. So. Did you go to school then? To further, to... my degree was in uh, theater. Yeah, my degree is in acting. My minor was in opera. And um, but, but I tell you, by the time I graduated, I knew exactly what I was doing. But I was the only graduate my senior year in the theater program. So, consequently, I won the theater <laughs> award. Uh, but uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I heard you got a job. I you moved it. to New York. You Mo- get a job on Broadway within 48 hours. Well, Is that the, accurate? It, that sounds uh, too easy. Uh, no, there was a five-year uh, intermission there. From the day that uh, I graduated from college... I got. I was like a deer in the headlights. I knew what I was doing. I didn't know how to make a living at it, and I got scared to death of it. So I went back, and I lived with my parents for five years, and, and I went into public relations. 
and uh, decided that this wasn't, you know, what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And, you know, had a little chat with that three-year-old kid that still defined himself as an actor. And uh, I finally went to New York and I got my first show 48 hours after I, I arrived in New York. But it was the longest 48 hours of my life. <laughs> but uh, I was lucky. I was just really lucky. But I also went prepared. Mm-hmm. I, I I went there prepared to be a success and not to try it out. So many people, I, I you know, I lived in Los Angeles for a while, and every every girl you'd meet, what do you do? I'm an actress, you know, really. They're all waitresses. <clears throat> you must run into people that want to, for whatever reason, a lot of people want to be actors for, a lot of people don't even really like the craft. They just want, I think, the fame or the attention or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I think, no, people like to be famous and or people like to be notorious. I don't think they like the life of an actor. I don't think they like the study of being an actor. Um, and so ultimately, I think that talent rises to the top. And people will ask me, how do I, you know, how do I make it in the business? I say, study. Yeah. You've got to be, if you're good, someone will find you. But some people that, when I lived in LA, some yeah. people, some guys that I knew and stuff, I mean, they wanted to be, they, I mean, they just, for like 10 years, they've been trying to be an actor and they're always looking for that big break and they just blew. I mean, they just, they sucked. I mean, do people, I mean, people must come up to you all the time. Oh, how can I get, you know. And I have no answer for them because it happens. I mean, it's like, it, it, it's, well, we'll use a common denominator. Let's let's say it's beer and it always takes, beer always takes the shape of what it's poured into. Uh, talent and, and uh, it, uh, you know, and artistic ability are very much, they take the shape of what they are uh, yeah. poured into. Some people just life. aren't cut out for it. Exactly I mean, right. it, you know. The, exactly right. And the business, and the business is stacked against you. The deck is always stacked against you. Because there are many more people than are there are opportunities to perform. Did so it's you, a very difficult. Uh, I would talk anybody out of the business rather than into the business. When your parents, <clears throat> when 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 you said I want to be an actor and I want to go to school, get a degree in theater and opera. I mean, I, what did your parents do? What they were their did careers? everything they could to discourage. That's me. what I'm saying. I mean, did they they say, "Come on, mm-hmm. that's crazy. But get a I, real job." But, but I also think it's the type of business that if you can be talked out of it, you should be. Because, the, as I say, your chances of working and making a living at it of any substance at all are, are one in a hundred. Yeah. Less, probably. Yeah. And, and so, so they tried to talk you out of it. Mm-hmm. But were they supportive then when you? Uh, to some degree they were supportive. And I think it wasn't until I, um, I started making a decent living in, um, um, at it. Uh, and consistent living at it that they've started to realize. Also, when I started showing up on the uh, covers of the soap opera magazines and my mother was in line at the grocery store, the kinda, <laughs> I think that was kind of the final uh, the final imprimatur, I think. I got the uh, the seal of approval. <laughs> what soap yeah. operas were you, were you on back uh, in the day? Well, I started off on uh, in the 80s, back in kind of the golden age of uh, daytime. Was uh, I was on Edge of Night, um, then took that off the air and then I uh, went over to, uh, <laughs> I went over to loving a show that was popular. No, in, I remember uh, that in the eighties and nineties. Uh, I was the first twin brothers on daytime television Oh, back in, uh, in the eighties when they were just cutting their eye teeth on the idea that if you had two people or one person, they could play two people and it would be kind <laughs> of a neat thing. So they had, um, and they had to find a double for me. So they found this guy that was a, a bouncer down at the limelight, uh, uh, uh disco down on 19th street and um he was an extra basically so he stood there and he had my build and you know at the he time he looked I, like you from behind exactly basically. right so but he, he talked like this everything was like, kind of <laughs> like this, you know kind of a d stems and those kind of guy and so he would say my lines and he would throw me off so much because I'm listening to my lines being said by these dumps and does. And I go, just please tell him not to say anything. I'll, I'll match the timing in my head. It's much easier than if he talks. And, um, so when we would finish the scene, um, he would go back down to uh, his dressing room. He said, because I'm writing my play. I said, you're writing a play. are you? I said, well, good for you. <laughs> It was Chaz Palminteri. Oh, wow. He was writing Bronx Tale. <laughs> wow. Is that funny? True wow. story. Wow. Chaz Palminteri made his living as my body double on daytime television. Wow. And he, and he was writing Bronx Tale while we were doing the show. Daytime television huh. has really been uh, decimated. I mean, they just does, I think there's a couple of shows. And it's yep. funny. I was just talking about this with someone the other day. It, there was actually a, a, a commercial for, for some soap opera or whatever, some daytime thing. And, and I said, you know, I, I've never really even watched daytime, but I forget what show it was. 
I watched something maybe about two years ago, mm. and the production values of this, I couldn't believe that this was on a network. I mean, they've really, uh, the production values were absolutely atrocious because they have no budget for these things at all. Well, they never did. I mean, everything was always kind of... You know they 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 can't use CGI. cardboard sets. Yeah, and yeah. That well, kind no, of they, crap, I mean the production. You know? you know, just when they what they don't what they do well is get up close in your face and do relationships very well. Yeah, they do relationship scenes very well. What they don't do are these action scenes that they you know they try to put in these you know these you know people are being saved from a volcano and you know the molten lava type of thing. That's just not something that daytime can produce well. It's too you can't do it inside of a television studio. But what they do well are relationship studies. Um, and that's what they've always made their, you know, that's what they've always hung their hook on. But you're right. Daytime television is disappearing. It's like, uh, so many of the shows have gone, uh, have gone under, uh, and there's only like four left, I think. Uh, but that kind of uh, was probably a good, uh, I mean, the only analogy I can think of is, is in radio. When I started in radio, I worked midnight to 6 a.m. No one listens to the radio from midnight to 6 a.m., <clears throat> but it was uh, an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to sort of learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that that a lot of those daytime shows were uh, uh, were a stepping stone to guys like you to learn the craft. I would say in in many respects, although there are actors that have made their their livings off daytime that are on, you know, that have been were there back in the 70s and 80s when in the 80s when I was there uh, that have made their careers off daytime. So and if you tell them that it's a great training ground, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll give you a, a paper cut with the script <laughs> that they just spent their, their entire day learning. Uh, you know, they don't like to hear that it's a, it's a training ground. No, because it's a medium of its own. Uh, but it's, uh, but it does, it gives you a, a, a great sense of what do you do on television when the only thing that matters is that one little black hole and there mm-hmm. is no audience out there. Mm-hmm. And it's a difficult thing to learn. That, that is a craft you have to learn is the fact that the television camera, as we're talking here, there's a camera on us and you have to let the camera do its own work. You do your work with the other person and you relate to the other people and you let the camera do its work. But that's a difficult thing to learn uh, as an actor because you feel like, oh, you've got to you know, work towards the camera right. and stuff. It's a difficult thing to learn. Uh, John O'Hurley is here. He'll be, uh, he's in uh, the play Chicago. Starts tomorrow, goes through January 12th at Palace Theater at Playhouse <laughs> Square. And he also has a book signing uh, tonight at 6 p.m. at Barnes & Noble in Crocker Park out there in, uh, in Westlake. The Perfect Dog. Is yes, what, it's, a, it's a children's book that I wrote. It's a Dr. Seuss-style poem that I wrote for my seven-year-old son last year. I host the National Dog Show mm-hmm. on uh, Thanksgiving Day on NBC. And uh, every year I write something special for it, and this was uh, something that I wrote last year. It was, a, a, as I said, a Dr. Seuss-style poem about the idea, is there a dog that is perfect? And all of the elements would go into the perfect dog. And it was something that I wrote for my son, and it went uh, went viral. A couple million people watched it, and my publisher, who has done my other two books, said, why don't we take this and make a children's book out of it? So we did, and it uh, has done very well. We sold out first day on Amazon. It became number one, and done well. And your son is seven years old. Mm-hmm. You you had him, I think you were, what, like 52 or something mm-hmm. when you had your son? Yeah. So you were late. It was mm-hmm. later. Is mm-hmm. that the only, your only child? That was my only child, yeah. I finally mm-hmm. found a woman that dropped her standards low enough, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what what took so long? Was it just that you hadn't found the right person yet? Or you... Yeah, I really didn't. In fact, until I met my wife, I really kind of figured that I probably would go childless. And it was okay. And I had come to terms with that and said that was okay. But once I met my wife 10 years ago, we've been married, uh, we've been married for 10, so I met her 12 years ago actually uh i just knew that this was the person and and then did you want to have kids at that point mm-hmm. because yeah. just you're in your mm-hmm. 50s at that point a mm-hmm. lot of people are saying hey this is a time to just i don't know. think i don't think now i would consider having <laughs> a child i'd be the only dad at a pta meeting with a colostomy bag i think you know <laughs> But it it, it it yeah it's different it's it's different being an older father. But I have now the means and the time to spend time with my son um, that I wouldn't have had when I was in my twenties and thirties. Right. I don't think I'd be anywhere near the parent that I was. When you when you were cast on Seinfeld as Jay Peterman, was that was that at the height of Seinfeld or was it the very beginning? I don't remember no, exactly we were, what seasons. Um, was. Let's see. We were about. I did the last four seasons, so we were midway through the run when it was just when it was kind of hitting its its peak is the number one show. So it was already a big show. and, and It was so the number was... one show uh, and uh, substantially, and 
and it, it established itself as appointment television on Thursday night around uh, NBC's block there. I think Friends had just started. What were you doing at the time before you got there? Were you, were I uh, was busy killing a, uh, a uh, show on ABC yeah. uh, that literally was, uh, they pulled the plug on it um, the day before I started Seinfeld. And it, was the mo- it was the most opportune of circumstances for me. What and and so that was. Did you have to go and, and audition for no. this role, or did they contact you, or how did this come? They about? heard that uh, the show. They heard they had heard that my series uh, sitcom had been canceled, and uh, and they had this guest star role on, uh, that they were writing into the script, and they thought you know that it was wacky enough that I would be able to take it and chew it pretty well. Mm-hmm. So they, uh, so I went in on uh, Friday morning and began the, uh, went to the um, script reading and they just handed me the catalog and said, we want him to sound the way the, ca- the J. Peterman catalog is written because it was a real catalog. And of course I'd never seen it and I'd never heard about it before, but in reading these long adventure stories about an Oxford button down, um, <laughs> I, I, they sounded, you know, it was kind of a Hemingway style. And, uh, and so I thought it was kind of a... It kind of a 40s radio drama combined with a little bit of a bad Charles Kuralt. And so that's that was the genesis of the character. He just kind of this uh, became this kind of bombastic uh, Mr. Magoo. And it was originally designed just to be an episode or so. It was just an episode. And by the time they had finished writing it, um, uh, she was working for the J. Peterman catalog. And everybody turned to me and said, <laughs> well, congratulations. Looks like you have a job. And I went, oh, really? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So you were uh, you were on uh, 20 episodes. You weren't in all the episodes, No, I, yeah, I did usually but... about, I don't know, I never, I never really counted. I think it was more like 30, I think, that I did. Something and, like and that. And th- throughout this period of time, do you- I did are, about half the episodes each season. Are you working on other things, or is this oh, your yeah, primary- I was, doing, I was doing a lot of other things mm-hmm. at the time. Um, and- um, but but that was the most you know in any time they called you was cancel everything else you know you know is it a lot of people like like William Shatner and Captain Kirk he's like just he's tied to Captain Kirk mm-hmm. you are tied to Jay Peterman mm-hmm. are you okay with that oh absolutely you don't mind that oh no not at all it was it, I mean it's it's who you were at a time and you were lucky enough to be on. Uh, uh, one of arguably one of the greatest shows in the history of television. No, I'm I'm very very great. Never typecast. I mean, it never you never had a problem getting any other roles then because people couldn't see you as anything other than Jay Peterman. No, I, I I don't think I did. I wouldn't know if I didn't get something. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not like they they tell you what you didn't get. Um, there have been yeah, I've done roles that have been similar to this because they see that already. Um, but I've done a lot of things that are different. I'm in the middle of doing a movie right now where I'm actually bald. Uh, so, you know, I may have a totally different look and a totally different style. So, What what was the, uh, looking back at that time, what was the favorite uh, moment of yours from working on that show? From Seinfeld, I think, um, I would say my favorite show um, was the uh, one, one of the ones with the wedding cake episode. I thought that was one of the best episodes that we did as a cast. Where they switch the, uh, she switches the With the, the, with the, the, the $2 slice of Entenmann's. <laughs> yeah. And also, but that's also the one where, where, um, uh, uh, where uh, George had the, uh, the, the score, the, the record score on the Frogger machine. Oh, that's right. And, and it was, I just thought the way the writing of that show and the way it was directed and the Frogger machine having to move across the street and what was actually a mimic of the Frogger game, I just thought some of that was just brilliant. I, I just thought some of that, and The Wedding Cake, I thought was some of the best stuff that they'd written. Um, the whole thing was, I just thought, a really, really well constructed episode i think it was really our show it was the show at its best i think how did everyone what's the <coughs> dynamic there how did everyone get everyone got along Fabulously. very well yes, and you yes. never you never sort of know on you know no, as an and, outsider and of, it was always a very uh, very harmonious relationship there on the show because jerry you know jerry and jerry was oh, jerry's jerry was a guy who would stroll around the set with his hands in his pockets you know eating a bowl of cereal he was the most unassuming guy he was just so suburban um, and just easygoing and very funny and just a very affable guy. And that set the tone for the set. 
Um, there were no egos. You know, very. It was just a very easy. I think everybody was just really grateful to be doing such a smart show. And what about Larry David? Was he just crazy. as he, he just as he is He's on crazy. his own show? He's he a, is crazy without social graces. Would he? Be, who do you think? That, if you had to pick one guy as the 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 genius behind that that series, would you pick? Seinfeld, or would you pick Larry David? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I cross between Larry and Jerry were so similar in their senses of humor. But you have to look at the writers. The writers just got this idea. And remember, there's a writing staff of maybe eight to 12 guys that are there 24 7. I mean, they, they live there nine months a year, and no one ever leaves the set. You know, they're always working on the script. So they get that style of humor, and I think they were the geniuses, the writing staff, because they were able to replicate every week that same sense of three absurdly dissimilar comedic subplots that would all find a way to cross each other at some ridiculous point in the show. And that's genius to do for 180 episodes. I mean, it just is. It, it, that would be very difficult to, you know, some of these guys, they're stand-up comedians or writers <clears throat> or whatever. It would be very difficult to, to for, for me to craft something, to write that, mm -hmm. and then hand it over to you and everyone else on that show, and you guys get all the glory for it. <laughs> and they're the ones, like you said, they're the ones that are really uh, coming up with the brilliance of, or, of the show. Or I'll, I'll, I'll take it one step worse when you see it um, edited out by uh, because the show's too long. It's very difficult. Uh, what kind of, uh, on a show like that, just because I'm curious... A writer, and we we know, of course, what the stars end up getting paid. We see that in the in in you know trade magazines and that kind of stuff, or in gossip columns. But these writers, what kind of dough are they pulling in on a, well, a show like that? You know, that's always negotiable. Your your writing contracts are renewed, and you know, so you, they could be into the hundreds of thousands. Um, but I mean, generally I would say a, a writer for a sitcom, if it's a half hour sitcom is getting probably 50,000 for the script. Wow. Wow. And it's a lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work that goes into that. And then, you know, but then, and then the, all the writers on the show will then take, you know, they'll, they'll get in and work that, that script over and it will probably not resemble anything near what you presented them the first time. Right. Right. Well, it, uh, we had great episodes, of course, yeah. and, uh, and and everyone remembers. And people must just come up to you on the street nonstop. Uh, every day, Peterman. Some, every day, <laughs> someone will come up and say Peterman. Yep. But I, you know, it's it's, it's uh, uh, you did something right once in your life, you know. And it's it, it, I smile every time someone says that. You know, because I made someone smile. You know, it's, and it's uh, nice to, and it's nice to have that feeling that you did something right once. You know what's great? You said that you didn't really watch, uh, you know, the first run episodes. But if if you ever go back, I mean, it's constantly. You can flip through a channel, you'll find a Seinfeld episode on TV someplace. And if you go back and you look at that first season, it's it's not good. I mean, it's it's just the pacing is. Well, they. I think they just, found their stride, or after the first four or five episodes, I think they found it. Uh, but the first uh, three or four episodes were a little tough. Yeah. Yeah, it's they were it's little, amazing it that w what ended up, and then it was like a well-oiled machine, yeah. like you mm -hmm. said. I mean, probably mm -hmm. you know, one of the greatest, if yep. not the greatest, yep. sitcoms. Kramer was always going to walk through the door and make some sort of skid stop, <laughs> and uh, and and you know, George really that character of Costanza, which I always thought was the most difficult character to play, because he didn't have. He, he wasn't, it wasn't a physical comedian. He wasn't, and, and the character excel, it itself was kind of eternally mediocre. You know, George lived on the swinging from the middle rung of the ladder of life. Yeah. You know, right there in the meaty part of the bell curve. He was not going to, he was going, he would be, he would be enthusiastically mediocre. You know, and I think that that role, therefore, was the toughest to play because he had to be so passionate about his mediocrity. You know, in the hands of any other actor, that uh, that role would have just, it would have disappeared. Uh, John O'Hurley will be in Chicago. That starts tomorrow. Open tomorrow night at Playhouse Square. Goes through January 12th, Palace Theater at Playhouse Square. I'm going to give you the number for tickets. It's 216-241-6000. That's 216-241-6000. Or PlayhouseSquare.org. You can get tickets uh, there. 
And would you say, uh, what about people who have never come out and seen anything like this? Oh, this I mean, is, well, that you're going to be seeing one of the five greatest musicals ever done in the history of Broadway. Is this something like a yep. guy like me? I have to, I have no, to be don't. honest. I go, I, I don't know, like going to like a play or a musical. No, I, listen, I, I am lucky enough to wear a tuxedo and uh, work with uh, eight women wearing lingerie on stage every night. <laughs> I, I hate my life. <laughs> it's uh, some of the best musical that Candor and Ebb ever wrote. Uh, certainly the best choreography that Bob Fosse ever did. Uh, so you're, you're watching one of the greatest shows in the history of Broadway, and it's going to be here. And i got to tell you, we've had this tour out since um, September, and of, I've been touring this show since uh, 2005, and this by far is the best touring cast I've ever worked with. It's, it's remarkable what they put up on that stage. Tickets are still available uh, through the run through uh, the 12th, and then uh, John's going to be... Uh, signing copies of his book, The Perfect Dog, well, which is a, tonight, a, a yeah. children's book yeah, be there that tonight. he wrote. I'll be reading it, and I'll be signing it. That's 6 p.m. at the Barnes & Noble in, uh, in Crocker Park out there in Westlake. John, I appreciate you coming in. Have fun in. to be here. Have fun while love you're here you, in town. Love what you've done with the room. Oh, uh, th- <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peterman approved our uh, <laughs> studio in here. I have to take a quick break, and we will be right back on Rover's Morning Glory. Hang on. Rover's Morning Glory.